we're going to look at some periodic trends. Um, one of those is atomic size. And before we can look at the trend in atomic size, we have to address, well, how do you define atomic size? Because we just learned that the electrons are essentially these standing waves in different fantastic shapes that overall add up to being roughly spherical. But how do you measure the edges of that, right? Um, so there's a couple of different methods. You could look at the non-bonding atomic radius. That's also known as the van der Waals radius. And we get that by looking at an atomic solid, measuring the distance between two nuclei, and dividing that in half. And we say, well, that must be the radius of the atom. We can also look at a bonding atomic radius, also known as a covalent radius. And so you've, here we have two bromine atoms covalently bonded together to form a bromine molecule. So we can look at the distance between the nuclei in this bond and divide that by half, by two. So for nonmetals, it's going to be half the distance between two of the atoms bonded together. For metals, which don't form covalent bonds, we're going to look at half the distance um, between two atoms in a crystal of the metal. For metals, that's going to be very, very similar to the van der Waals radius. Um, when, when bromine atoms covalently bond together, their, their nuclei get closer than their van der Waals radius would suggest. And so you don't get the same answer for all of these different methods of measuring atomic size. So we're just going to think of this in terms of a very general term, atomic radius. And this is an average based on measuring the radius in a, a number of different situations. This atomic radius is always going to be smaller than the van der Waals radius, because whenever you, you get a covalent bond, um, that squishes the atoms together, and so it causes the radius to be a little smaller. Um, the approximate bond length for covalent bonds is the sum of the atomic radii. That's for covalent bonds only. So there are trends in atomic radius. Um, and we're going to look at trends um, as what's going on up and vertically in the, in the periodic table and horizontally. So what we observe as you go down a group in the periodic table, like we can look at lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. Those are all in group 1A. So as we go down that column in the periodic table, we observe that the atomic radius gets larger. So cesium is larger than rubidium. Lithium is smaller than sodium. It is not a linear trend, but it is a trend. And that's all that we need to, to know. It makes sense that they get bigger, right? Because cesium has a lot more protons, neutrons, and electrons than, than lithium does. So it makes sense that it's larger. What doesn't make intuitive sense is that as we go across a period in the periodic table, they get smaller. You would think that they'd get larger for the same reason. Well, it's got more protons, more electrons. It should be larger, right? But what we're doing as we're coming across, let's look at boron through neon. Boron has its valence electrons in the second principal level, right? This is, ends with 2p1. And this is 2p2, 2p3, 2p4, et cetera. So if we think of building up atoms by just adding on electrons, we're adding the electrons into the same sublevel. If you think, well, actually into the same principal energy level. If you think back to the Bohr model, which we know is not correct, but it still can be convenient to think of. So here's your nucleus. And there was n equals 1 and n equals 2, and n equals 3. So boron has one, um, oh, boron. boron has three electrons in the second 
level. It's got the 2s2 and 2p1. Fluorine has four more electrons, but where are they? What level are they in? They're still in level two, right? Fluorine, its electron configuration ends with 2p5. Boron is 2p1. So they both have two 2s electrons. And then all we're doing as we're going across is we're adding electrons in here. The second level is roughly the same for those atoms. So we might expect, well, they're going to be the same size. Why are they getting smaller? Do you understand why they're not getting bigger? As we're going down, lithium, sodium, potassium, then we're having electrons in larger and larger principal levels. Right? So we're expanding out. Here, we're adding, as we go across, we're just adding in the same sub, same uh, level, energy level. The reason they get smaller is due to shielding. I think I've got a picture coming up. Yeah. So here's the nucleus for a lithium atom. It's got three protons in it. Um, let's just write in the uh, electron configuration for this. Whoops, not a three, two. So here's the electron configuration. So it has one valence electron and two core electrons. So here are the core electrons in this blue fuzzy space. And here's the valence electron in the next level out. These two core electrons shield the outer electron from the nucleus. Instead of seeing this full positive three charge, it's obscured by these two electrons. And it's not exactly subtracting, but that's close enough for our purposes. The effective nuclear charge that the valence electron sees is the actual nuclear charge minus the number of core electrons. And so this valence electron sees a plus one charge instead of a plus three charge. We learned from Coulomb's law that the energy is proportional to the charges on the opposite, on the charged species. So here we've got a negative one charge and effectively a positive one charge. These guys are seeing a positive three charge. The force of attraction for these is larger because of the increased charge and because they're closer in to start with. This guy, because he's being shielded, is not as attracted to the nucleus. He's more loosely held. And so that causes that level to expand slightly. So as we go across, we're increasing the actual charge on the nucleus, but we've got some shielding. And so as we're going across, the effective nuclear charge is increasing. And so the valence electrons that were farther out for lithium, another picture? No. When we have, um, let's, do, let's do boron. Let's make this into boron. So if we make this into boron, now we've got a five plus charge in the middle. And valence electrons, we've got three valence electrons. These valence electrons um, now are seeing five minus two effective nuclear charge. There are still two core electrons, but the number of protons in there has gone up. So if the effective nuclear charge here is larger, that's going to cause the electrons to get pulled in. So as we go across, the effective nuclear charge increases, and the electrons get pulled in tighter and tighter. It's not a huge difference, but it is significant. Any questions? So we've got, in these multi-electron systems, we've got electrons simultaneously being attracted to the nucleus and repelled by other electrons. So the presence of core electrons causes the 
valence electrons to not experience the full strength of the nuclear charge. So when we talk about effective nuclear charge, it's the atomic number minus the number of core electrons, the shielding. Valence electrons are an ex a very small contribution, and so we can just ignore those. So what are the effective nuclear charges of nitrogen and argon? Well, let's look at the electron configuration for nitrogen. 1s2, 2s2, 2p what? Three. And argon? One S two, two S two, two P six, three S two, three P. How many in that three P? Six. Okay, so those are their electron configurations. In nitrogen, which of these are the valence electrons? The ones in the second level, so 2s and 2p, these are valence electrons. These are core electrons. The valence electrons are those with the highest principal quantum number. And the core electrons are everything below that. So in argon, which ones are the valence electrons? The threes, right? 3s2 and 3p6. Those are the valence electrons. And these are the core electrons. How many core electrons does argon have? 10. And how many core electrons does nitrogen have? Nitrogen has two core electrons. Okay, so to find the effective nuclear charge for nitrogen, we need nitrogen's atomic number, which is seven, right? It's got seven protons. And then we're going to subtract the number of core electrons, two core electrons. And so it has an effective nuclear charge of plus five. What's argon's atomic number? 18. Remember, the atomic number is the big number on the periodic table with that elements symbol. So 18. And then we're going to subtract the number of core electrons, which is 10. It has an effective nuclear charge of plus 8. So a higher effective nuclear charge causes the electrons to be pulled in a little bit. Any questions? So quantum mechanics explaining the trend. As we're moving down a column, atoms get smaller. I'm sorry, larger. Atoms get larger. Um, because the principal quantum number of the valence electrons is increasing. And so they are in orbitals that have uh, a larger radius, in essence. The, the orbitals are larger, and so the atom is larger. Moving across a period, the effect of nuclear charge is increasing, but the principal quantum level is staying the same. So they are roughly the same distance, but with the increase of the nuclear charge, they are pulled in. And so the orbitals are pulled in, and we get smaller atomic radii. Does that make sense? We need to be able to remember the trends. And this is another one of those situations where we've got, like, Right and left, bigger, smaller, how do we keep them straight? 
the way I remember these is I made sense of it in terms of why, and then I can reason it out. I don't have to just rote memorize. So going down is pretty easy. That makes sense. Going across, if you remember, OK, we're filling up this same level, but we're increasing the charge on the nucleus, so it's pulling them in. That'll help you to remember that as you go across, it's getting smaller. The transition metals, of course, are going to be squirrely. Um, going down a column, they're going to increase in size, just like the main group elements. But going across, um, it's much less predictable. They're going to be roughly the same size. Um, because their valence electrons are in the S, and, and we're adding electrons into the D or sublevel that's below. It's not a valence level. So that's not changing um, very much. And the effective nuclear charge, because we're also increasing, as we increase the charge in the nucleus, we're also increasing the number of core electrons it doesn't really cause much change in the effective nuclear charge. OK, so I'm going to go back to the graph. So this is going down a period, sorry, going down a group. And as we go across a period, so here's lithium at one end on the far left and neons on the far right. And we see as we're going across, the atomic radius decreases. And period two, and period three, period four, or five, and six. In the green here, those are the period four transition elements. And there's not a lot of change here. It just kind of is sort of flat, right? And that's because of, of what we just talked about. We're adding D electrons that aren't valence electrons. So these are general trends. There are exceptions. I mean, here's an exception right here. This one's larger than that one. Um, but mostly, we just need to remember the general trend. So we should be able to answer questions like this. Uh, choose the larger atom in each pair, if possible. So tanner iodine. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the periodic table and find these. So I'm going to draw a piece of the periodic table. Here's tin, and go over a couple, and there's iodine. We need to know where they are relative to each other so we can look at the trends. So they are in the same period. So we're looking at that trend of going across. As we go across from left to right, do they get larger or smaller? Smaller. smaller. So which of these is the larger atom? Tin. So tin is larger. Let's look at germanium and polonium. So germanium is up here, and polonium is down there. So we've got two things going on. We've got going across. And we've got going down. So if we look at the going down trend, which one would be larger? Polonium. polonium, because it's below, right? So that predicts that polonium's the larger. The going across trend, going across things get smaller, so that would predict that germanium's larger. So these are at odds with each other. So this would be a situation on a multiple choice test where if they're giving you the choice cannot be determined, that would be a good choice because we've got conflicting trends here. What if you have to choose? Which, which trend do you think is, is more significant? Going down. Because as we're going down in the periodic table, we're filling the next principal energy level. Those are definitely bigger. As we're going across, we've got in effective nuclear charge increasing. 
which pulls things in a little bit, but that effect is not as large. So if you have to choose here, I would choose polonium as being larger. Let's look at chromium and tungsten. So here's chromium and here's tungsten. Which one's bigger? Tungsten. Because the trend is as you go down, they get larger. Any questions?